Uh, so good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Mazar Amir Ali. Uh, I'm a physician and a nephrologist uh, working with the Africa Healthcare Network as the country medical director for Tanzania, but also deputy to Dr. Lloyd, our chief medical officer. And uh, today we are going to have our fireside chat number 155. Uh, we will be having it with uh, Professor Michelle Wong, uh, who is a clinical assistant professor in the Division of Nephrology, uh, University of British Columbia in Vancouver, uh, Canada. Uh, Dr. Wong's uh, research focuses on complications of chronic kidney disease, including volatile energy, energy wasting, anemia, volume overload, and hypertension. At British Columbia Reno, she is currently co-leading an interprofessional research program in renal nutrition. She is a recipient of the Marcia Bell Distinguished Scholar Award and has received research funding from the Michael Smith Health Research in British Columbia and Kidney Foundation of Canada. She is actively engaged in the International Society of Nephrology as a member of the North America and Caribbean Regional Board the Emerging Leaders Program 2021 cohort. She is a member of the Canadian Society of Nephrology Clinical Practice Guidance Committee and the Canadian Nephrology Trials Network Communications and Engagement Committee. And uh, she will be taking us on effective management of chronic hypothemia, a holistic approach integrating nutritional and clinical strategies. Professor Wong, the floor is yours and you're most welcome. Thanks very much for that introduction and uh, happy to be here today to talk about hyperkalemia management uh, with a focus on dietary aspects. Um, at the end of the presentation, I will have a poll um, uh, using an app called Poll Everywhere. So you can use the QR link to connect and I will activate the questions once um, the time comes. You can go to pollev.com slash Michelle Wong 208 and uh, you can answer that the poll questions at the end. Okay, so these are my disclosures and these are our learning objectives. Uh, so first of all uh, is to recognize common misconceptions in potassium management regarding diet. And secondly, to understand an etiology-based approach for management of hyperkalemia. And thirdly, to be aware of new resources for potassium management, focusing on diet uh, for both healthcare providers and patients. So as a background, the prevalence of, of hyperkalemia is very high uh, in patients with advanced chronic kidney disease, up to 73%, is also high in patients with uh, chronic heart failure up to 40%. And given that common interface between CKD, heart failure, and diabetes, uh, RAS inhibitors are often used in patients with kidney dysfunction. And therefore, hyperkalemia is a common barrier to optimal RAS inhibitor prescription. Hyperkalemia itself is associated with increased risks of hospitalization, mm -hmm. emergency department visits, mortality, cardiovascular events, and greater use of healthcare resources. So this is a summary of changes in potassium handling in CKD. In uh, patients with normal kidney function, renal excretion is 90% of the total excretion and colonic excretion is 10%. Uh, but colonic excretion increases with kidney disease up to uh, 25 to 30% of total excretion in advanced kidney disease. Therefore, constipation can contribute to hyperkalemia. And in CKD, um, patients can maintain a relatively normal plasma uh, potassium concentration despite a significant reduction in kidney mass due to increased potassium secretion in the remaining nephrons. In the absence of other factors, patients can maintain normal serum potassium until GFR declines to 15 to 20. However, we know that there's uh, many, many other uh, factors that may uh, cause hyperkalemia in patients with CKD. And then there's the drug therapies uh, that are commonly used in CKD, uh, such as the RAS inhibitors, as well as medications that block intracellular potassium uptake, like beta blockers. Um, and the graph on the right shows the potassium concentration uh, for patients with kidney disease, with, with uh, reduced kidney function, and those with normal kidney function. So we know that the potassium concentration is greater in patients with CKD, but they follow a similar circadian rhythm with the highest level at uh, in the afternoon at 1 to 3 p.m. and at lowest level at 9 p.m. 
Uh, we also see the variation throughout the day is much greater in patients with CKD. So the difference or the range of the difference between the max and the, the minimum is uh, 0 0.71. And we also have a reminder that serum potassium is greater than plasma uh, potassium by about 0.36. And this is due to uh, potassium release during clotting. And so you can get higher potassiums with a traumatic venipuncture or prolonged time from blood collection to processing. And so uh, just a reminder, there are multiple points along the uh, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system pathway that can be affected by disease states or medications that would ultimately impair potassium excretion by the kidney. Uh, and uh, just a reminder, KDGO recommends the RAS inhibitors uh, being used in, for patients with hypertension and diabetes who have uh, albuminuria, as well as for patients with uh, hypertension without diabetes, although the uh, grade of evidence is uh, a little bit lower. And in patients without albuminuria, uh, ACE inhibitors and ARBs are still reasonable uh, choices for antihypertensives. Um, in this subpopulation, uh, there may not be particular clear benefits for CKD progression, but certainly there are cardiovascular uh, benefits for using RAS inhibitors in patients without albuminuria. Um, the guidelines recommend titrating to maximum approved doses of the RAS inhibitors uh, with monitoring of uh, blood pressure, potassium, and creatinine two to four weeks after initiation. We see, however, that uh, RAS inhibitor use for guideline indications such as diabetes and albuminuria is suboptimal in many regions of the world. Um, as you can see here, especially in the U.S. And the common reasons um, for this are, are often fear of hyperkalemia or uh, uh, dips in kidney function. And so uh, there was a, a debate about whether to continue or not to continue RAS inhibitors in advanced CKD. Uh, and we know that an old study in 2010 had found that um, ACE inhibitors and ARB discontinuation may delay onset of uh, renal replacement therapy in patients with advanced kidney disease. Uh, and often we see now that um, stopping RAS inhibitors is the most common intervention when faced with hyperkalemia uh, based on a, a recent Canadian study here. Uh, but we also know that continuing RAS inhibitors in advanced CKD has benefits in terms of improved um, uh, or reduced risk of cardiovascular events and reduced mortality, uh, as well as better blood pressure control. And there was a recent clinical trial, the STOP ACE uh, trial um, done in the UK, which looked at patients with stage four and five CKD who had a decline in EGFR of greater than two per year in the previous two years. And this looked at discontinuation versus continuation. And they really found no difference in EGFR, end-stage kidney disease, or renal replacement therapy, hospitalizations, or mortality for discontinuation uh, versus continuations. So this really does support the use uh, or the continued use of uh, RAS inhibitors in patients with advanced CKD. Our approach to monitoring and managing side effects with RAS inhibitors are first, as mentioned, to monitor the creatinine potassium within two to four weeks of starting or changing the dose of RAS inhibitors and um, continuing the ACE or ARB unless the serum creatinine rises by more than 30%. And if that does occur, it's important to look for uh, risk factors uh, and underlying causes such as volume depletion, um, NSAIDs, uh, and, and other reasons. And if there is hyperkalemia, uh, it's important to assess and manage for a reversible cause, uh, whether that be cellular lysis, acidosis, hyperglycemia, constipation, or use of um, medications like NSAIDs, and then looking at diet and considering uh, diuretics, um, optimizing bicarbonate levels and potassium binders if needed. And only as a last resort uh, should 
we consider reducing the dose or discontinuing the ACE inhibitor ARB uh, in the setting of uncontrolled hyperkalemia despite medical treatment. So these are uh, from the KDECO guidelines. So now I'm just gonna review a bit about the dietary aspects of potassium management. So I was involved with a joint cardio-renal initiative involving multiple nephrology and cardiology societies. And a toolkit was developed to optimize uh, RAS inhibitor prescription. And this tool here uh, is a summary of the dietary approaches to hyperkalemia. On the right, we list uh, common potassium misconceptions, and we're gonna review each of these myths in greater detail here. So myth one is restricting dietary potassium is useful to prevent chronic hyperkalemia. So historically, we focused on limiting foods with high potassium content, and guidelines recommended restrictions of daily potassium intake of two to 3,000 uh, uh, milligrams of potassium per day. Uh, and so this resulted in recommended diets uh, that were limited in uh, whole grains and limited in fruits and vegetables. Um, and there was also no focus on processed foods uh, or limiting processed foods with food additives. And now um, the potassium intake recommendation is more individualized and there is promotion of whole grains, plant-based eatings and fruit and vegetables with also an emphasis on limiting processed foods and food additives. So there really has been a bit of a paradigm shift. So the approach of restricting potassium intake is actually not evidence-based. Uh, the hypothesis that potassium restriction is useful is based on the assumption that different sources of dietary potassium are therapeutically equivalent. But in fact, we know that animal and plant sources of potassium differ in their potential to contribute to hyperkalemia. And there are really a scarcity of studies on how modifying diet can influence serum potassium levels. Uh, the recommendation of low potassium diets is from opinion-based guidelines and observational studies in people with CKD report weak associations between dietary potassium intake and potassium concentration. And we're gonna look a little bit closer at that evidence. Uh, so as indicated in the table, most observational studies found no association between increasing potassium intake and hyperkalemia in hemodialysis patients. In the one study that did show uh, an association uh, that correlation was weak, and you see the spread of the data here, uh, dietary potassium intake explained only 2% of the variance in the mean uh, serum potassium. And in the non-dialysis population, there was no correlation between the uh, dietary intake of potassium, which they measured through the 24-hour urinary potassium, and the, the blood potassium. And in fact, they found the factors that were most associated with the blood potassium were EGFR, cause of CKD, age, diabetes, and bicarbonate. Uh, however, patients with CKD do have impaired potassium tolerance. So this postprandial hyperkalemia is defined by an increased serum potassium that peaks two hours after a meal. Uh, the risk increases as the EGFR declines less than 45. And in addition to reduced renal clearance of potassium, there are many causes of postprandial hyperkalemia, including several modifiable dietary factors, uh, such as potassium content, and more importantly, the bioavailability, as well as the food processing, food preparation, the portion size, and the fiber intake. Uh, so people with low fiber intake may have less fecal potassium output. And cellular potassium uptake is mediated by insulin and influenced by acid-base balance, and therefore factors that, such as a low-carb meal, metabolic acidosis, or a sedentary lifestyle are all factors that can raise potassium levels in that postprandial state. And it's important to remember hypokalemia is multifactorial, so we suggest using a systematic etiology-based approach that places clinical and patient factors before consideration of diet. Um, so this includes lab sampling conditions, such as the time of day and the time in relation to a meal, uh, intercurrent illnesses, uh, medications, including uh, over-the-counter medications and supplements as well, and um, diabetes, metabolic acidosis, dehydration, constipation, and then diet, we'll go into a little bit more detail. And once we address the above modifiable factors, 
first, then we can consider adding a thiazide or lube diuretic and then a potassium binder. And as mentioned, the last resort is actually to uh, reduce or discontinue the RAS inhibitor if there's uncontrolled hyperkalemia. All right, myth two, avoid fruits and vegetables, the main source of dietary potassium. So not all sources of potassium are equal. Uh, potassium is quite ubiquitous. Um, in a U.S. study, the most common sources of potassium were uh, meat and fast food, not just fruits and vegetables. However, most patient resources on potassium management uh, in the U.S. and Canada recommend restriction of fruits and vegetables and plant-based proteins, but few of those resources recommend restricting potassium additives in ultra-processed foods. So this indicates an underappreciation of the factors that mitigate the rise of potassium with plant-based foods. So uh, plant-based foods have reduced bioavailability because of their fiber content, which uh, increases the uh, fecal um, excretion of the potassium. As well, they have uh, alkaline potential and insulin stimulation, which promote uptake of potassium into cells. Um, so, Many patients have overly restrictive diets and they could be missing out on potential health benefits of plant-based foods because of that traditional approach to um, hyperkalemia management. And so potassium content is different from bioavailability. Um, plant-based foods uh, have 50 to 60% bioavailability, while animal-based foods have 70 to 90% bioavailability. They also have a, a, a net acid load, which can reduce the uptake of potassium by cells. And uh, potassium salts, uh, which are commonly found in processed foods, have 90% bioavailability. And uh, so it's this hidden sources of potassium in processed foods due to food additives that we have to be careful about. And therefore, it's important to educate patients on label reading to identify those potassium additives, which are commonly found in uh, processed meats, uh, condiments, uh, canned soups, and salt substitutes. And that's a very important um, potential source of potassium additives. So our new patient resources in British Columbia uh, no longer contain lists of foods that are high and low in potassium. Uh, instead, it focuses on limiting processed foods and salt substitutes, uh, limiting items with very concentrated forms of potassium, like dried fruits or certain beverages like uh, juices or coconut water, as well as avoiding excessive animal protein intake, as well as encouraging whole unprocessed plant foods. So uh, the QR code is at the bottom there. And uh, this is from the British uh, Dietetics Association. So they have a culturally specific handout here incorporating African and Caribbean foods. Um, and so there are some foods here that may be more common in those cuisines, such as breadfruit, cassava, plantain, um, sweet potato, and taro. So those are examples of uh, root vegetables. So they recommend double boiling to leach out the potassium from those root vegetables. Uh, the same can be done for legumes. Um, and then, so this can be effective at leaching out about 50% of the potassium. And uh, there's also an ingredient uh, which is very common in Nigeria and Ghana called akon, uh, which is a, a type of potash. Uh, these are actually salts that are very high in potassium and sodium and therefore very high bioavailability of potassium. So this would be something to try to limit or avoid. And myth three, dietary potassium budget should be spent on animal protein. So there's been an evolution of the KDOKI guidelines uh, through the National Kidney Foundation. So back in 2000, they advised at least 50% of the dietary protein should be high biologic value, um, i.e. animal protein. In 2020, they updated that recommendation and they said there was insufficient evidence to recommend a particular protein type, plant versus animal, in terms of effects on nutritional status, calcium or, or phosphorus levels, or blood lipid profile. And so um, 
plant-based diets that are well-balanced and diverse are nutritionally adequate. Um, and if you have at least 0.6 uh, grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day, uh, keto analogs are not needed. Um, plants do contain essential amino acids, although there are differences in amino acid content, digestibility and availability between plant and animal-based foods. So plant-based diets can have many potential benefits that are due to pleiotropic effects and maybe mediated by higher potassium intake, higher fiber intake, base producing effects, uh, a more favorable gut microbiota profile and reduced oxidative stress. Uh, the benefits include improved cardiovascular and metabolic uh, comorbidities. Uh, it may mitigate CKD complications like hyperphosphatemia, acidosis and constipation. And uh, there's improved kidney outcomes, which we'll discuss in a bit more detail, as well as planetary health benefits. So for the most part, plant-based diets are not associated with hyperkalemia in both non-dialysis CKD and hemodialysis patients. In one study, there was just one patient with a renal tubular acidosis who did develop hyperkalemia. In terms of the evidence for plant-based diets and CKD progression, there are few small RCTs, but most are cohort studies. Uh, the EGFR outcome either showed no change or less decline with plant-based diets. Uh, there were single cohort studies that demonstrated plant-based diets are associated with reduced mortality and reduced end-stage kidney disease, as well as higher quality of life scores. Uh, and so this information has informed the newly published KDGO 2024 guidelines and as a practice point, uh, they advise people with CKD to adopt healthy and diverse diets with higher consumption of plant-based foods compared to animal-based foods and a lower consumption of ultra-processed foods. So there's been a thematic synthesis on patient views of dietary and food restrictions, and they found that patients often feel deprived, overwhelmed by confusing um, advice, uh, and dietary restrictions are often counterintuitive and disorienting and a source of social limitations. So rather than giving patients lists of foods that they can or cannot eat, uh, instead we suggest focusing on promoting healthy dietary patterns, supporting families and patients in their adaptation to dietary recommendations, and in, where possible encouraging traditional food ways um, and using education strategies that enhance nutrition literacy of patients. So some examples of uh, healthy dietary patterns include the Mediterranean diet, DASH diet, there's also the planetary health diet uh, listed on the right. And many traditional food ways already incorporate elements of plant-based diets and healthy dietary patterns. And therefore it's important to keep that in mind uh, when counseling patients um, uh, about uh, healthy dietary patterns. Okay, so back to this tool, it does provide a summary of recommendations, including endorsing balanced diets uh, while limiting processed foods, giving tips on food preparation and other considerations as such as uh, constipation management. Uh, and uh, so this is available through the ISM website and a QR code on the bottom. Just a quick note here about constipation. This is something that I um, address a lot more these days with my patients because that colonic excretion of potassium is uh, important. Uh, so we do have uh, patient handouts on, on constipation here. Um, and so often you have to counsel on uh, fiber intake, fluid intake, physical activity, as well as uh, uh, judicious use of uh, laxatives. Uh, we do want to avoid using magnesium-based laxatives to avoid the risk of hypermagnesemia. And just a quick note as well on diuretics. So including a diuretic can reduce the risk of hyperkalemia. Uh, it's useful when diuresis or additional antihypertensive agent is desired. Uh, there's a slight increased risk of acute kidney injury. Uh, there's risk of electrolyte abnormalities is uh, hyponatremia for the thiazide diuretics and uh, also uric acid elevations. Um, in the ASK study of non-diabetic adults with 
hypertension and CKD. Uh, they found that uh, concomitant diuretic use was associated with reduced risk of hyperkalemia, so a hazard ratio of 0.41. So this uh, can be an uh, important um, uh, way to treat hyperkalemia. And of note, high SGLT2 inhibitors also reduce risk of uh, serious hyperkalemia of, of potassium greater than 6. So this was found from... Uh, systematic review and meta-analysis of RCTs. So a hazard ratio of serious hyperkalemia was 0.84. So this is um, uh, one of the side benefits of using SGLT2 inhibitors in addition to the reduced risk of progression. Now, just a brief note on managing metabolic acidosis. Uh, so KDGO 2012 suggested that people with CKD and serum bicarbonate levels of less than 22 be treated with oral bicarbonate supplementation to try to keep the serum potassium, or sorry, serum bicarbonate uh, within normal range. Um, the new KDGO 2024 guidelines have um, changed that recommendation um, to uh, consider tr treatment uh, with of the metabolic acidosis pharmacologically or uh, with dietary intervention um, to prevent development of acidosis with potential clinical implications. So as an example, they, they gave a cutoff of less than 18. And so with the use of bicarbonate, we know there could be a risk of exacerbating hypertension or edema. This recent uh, systematic review, however, found that the adverse effects of sodium bicarbonate may be overstated. Um, and they found that sodium bicarbonate supplementation did not adversely affect systolic BP. Um, so, uh, and, and no increase in, their, in the use of, of diuretics. But anecdotally, this is something that uh, I have seen with, with patients. So um, the KDOKI 2024 guidelines always uh, mention to watch out for those uh, potential adverse effects of bicarbonate therapy. Um, it's interesting that fruit and vegetable intake, uh, which is uh, base producing, can improve metabolic acidosis. And they also have other effects in terms of reducing blood pressure and uh, reducing LDL, so uh, it may have a lot of other benefits as well as the um, metabolic acidosis um, management. So there, uh, uh, the dietitians are often involved in uh, helping patients uh, manage the metabolic acidosis. And just a few quick notes here on uh, potassium binders. So we have our traditional uh, sodium polystyrene sulfonate or calcium polystyrene sulfonate. Uh, and then our newer potassium binders, the sodium zirconium cyclosilicate and pterimer. Um, they are all um, ion exchangers. The SPS does tend to have uh, more uh, severe, uh, potentially severe uh, gastrointestinal side effects. Um, such as intestinal ischemia and uh, GI necrosis. Um, but all of these can have uh, GI side effects. Sodium zirconium cyclosilicate and pterimar are also generally more, much more expensive than the uh, SPS. And so in British Columbia, we uh, don't have the newer potassium binders funded yet uh, through our uh, provincial renal program. So, but we did look at the use of the SPS and the uh, calcium uh, polysulfonate uh, binders. And so uh, in BC, uh, the, in patients with chronic hyperkalemia uh, with uh, serum potassium greater than five, uh, only 27% of patients were dispensed a prescription of the potassium binder. Um, and the median time from the index date of hyperkalemia to the first prescription was 154 days. So that really shows us that clinicians are trying a lot of other strategies before they actually start a potassium binder. Um, it's moderately effective in reducing potassium. So it can reduce it by about 
or and in a study from Manitoba, uh, they looked at patients with de novo hyperkalemia above 5.5. And in, within the first month after the hyperkalemia episode, only 4% of patients received SPS or CPS. And uh, often these prescriptions were very short term. Uh, and of the patients taking RAS inhibitors, it was actually much more common for patients to discontinue the RAS inhibitor rather than receive a potassium binder. Um, I know that these um, uh, potassium binders are generally not particularly well tolerated uh, for long-term use for patients. So um, that, that's one of the uh, one of the negative parts of uh, using potassium binders. Uh, but the new potassium binders, they are effective in reducing uh, serum potassium, uh, and they may um, be able to enable spironolactone use. Uh, so that, that is uh, something that's being studied, uh, as well as uh, real world studies that have also shown that um, the new potassium binders can significantly um, increase or enable the RAS inhibitors prescription. And this study here uh, from Japan showed that uh, the new potassium binders, the sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, actually reduce mortality and hospitalization due to hyperkalemia. So I think um, that's where we're really heading more real world studies, especially also looking at uh, patient reported tolerability. Okay, so now I have some cases here. Um, and so I will start activating the pull everywhere here, but this is case number one, a 77 year old woman with CKD and EGFR 48, urine ACR 1.5 milligram per millimole past medical history of hypertension, osteoarthritis, UTI, blood pressure 122 on 65, routine outpatient fasting lab work demonstrates a serum potassium of 5.6 on two recent occasions. She's taking candesartan, rosuvastatin, acetaminophen, recently took a little bit of ibuprofen uh, in the last 10 days due to worsening joint pain, also takes glucosamine for the osteoarthritis, an occasional magnesium supplement. So what are her risks for hyperkalemia? You could actually put this in the chat box as just a kind of throwing out some ideas if you'd like. Yes, uh, so I see recent use of NSAIDs, GFR, the ARB, very good. Yes, so all of those are potential risk factors. Thank you. All right, so for uh, case one here, how would you recommend the, the first step for managing hyperkalemia? Uh, A, hold candesartan. B, counsel on over-the-counter medication supplement use. C, counsel to avoid eating bananas, tomatoes, avocados, and other high potassium content fruits and vegetables. D, no action needed. Or E, the first three things on that list. So I'm going to see here, there's some live poll answer responses here. So just go to pollev.com slash michellewog208 uh, and you can answer the question on that app. All right. And I see some answers coming up in the chat box as well. It's great. So most of you answered B and that's, that's great. So yes. Uh, I would say that is the uh, probably the most appropriate answer. Uh, so in terms of over-the-counter medications that can contribute to hyperkalemia, um, NSAIDs, they suppress uh, prostaglandin-mediated prostaglandin renin release, and they also reduce renal blood flow and EGFR. So that's the mechanism of hyperkalemia. And so in CKD, the plasma potassium can go up by more than one, um, which is much more than in someone with normal kidney function. And COX-2 inhibitors may have a greater risk of hyperkalemia than the non-selective NSAID. 
there's also things that you have to um, think about with uh, vitamins, uh, potassium supplements. Um, and there's been muscle building supplements that have uh, potassium in them as well. Um, you should also watch out for magnesium supplements. Uh, usually they'd have to be um, either um, high doses of magnesium citrate uh, as laxatives or IV magnesium to really contribute to hyperkalemia, but there have been case reports. And then in terms of herbal supplements and remedies, uh, be careful about glucosamine, um, which is um, uh, made from a potassium salt often um, from um, shrimp and crab exoskeleton. So that is a, in our case, uh, case number one, the glucosamine may be a really big factor in um, contributing to hyperkalemia. But there's other herbal supplements to be careful about. Um, alfalfa, dandelion, horsetail, nettle, milkweed, lily of the valley, et cetera. So uh, do ask your patients about supplements, herbal remedies that they're using. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of resources down here at the bottom. Okay, case number two, a 65 year old man with uh, type two diabetes, hypertension, no history of cardiovascular disease or heart failure, EGFR of 36, urine ACR of 60, milligram per millimole, A1C of 8.1%, blood pressure 140 and 85. Um, after increasing the telmosartan dose, the serum potassium rises to 5.9. Uh, other than telmosartan, the patients on amlodipine, atorvastatin, and pegliflozin, metformin, glycoside, vitamin D3, and ferrous fumarate, which he sometimes skips due to constipation. So what are his risks for hyperkalemia? We put that in the chat box, I think. Okay, great, I see constipation, that's good. He's got diabetes, yep. GFR, yes. Medications, uncontrolled blood sugar, good. Yeah, so the SGLT2 inhibitor may be uh, helping and reducing the, the potassium potentially. Um, but yeah, the, the telmosartan uh, can definitely raise the potassium. So, okay, all right. So when we look at our list again, um, we have our RAS inhibitor, our diabetes with hyperglycemia, Patients with diabetes also often have hyporedenemic hypoaldosteronism, constipation, and uh, diet factors. Okay, so for case two, how would you recommend treating this patient for initial hyperkalemia management? So there's an adathiazide diuretic, added GLP-1 agonist, increase the SGLT2 inhibitor dose, add a potassium binder, dietary counseling. Okay, so I'm seeing here, we have picked A and B and D, and there's, uh, this one may have a few multiple answers actually. So I'm just curious of what, uh, what you would decide. So you can go, oops, sorry, yeah, go to, wholeev.com slash Michelle Wong 208 to record your answer. Okay, but I see a lot of your answers coming up in the chat box. So there's a variety of answers across the board. Uh, I think that you can have multiple answers for this one. Um, adding a thiazide diuretic, it would be good because the patient has suboptimal blood pressure control. His uh, systolic blood pressure was 140. Um, so certainly that can help with potassium excretion as well. Um, adding a GLP-1 agonist can be helpful to optimize his glycemic control because his A1C was 8.1%. So that would also be a good strategy. Increasing the SGLT2 inhibitor dose is probably um, unlikely to um, uh, impact his blood sugars. At GFRs, especially in the 30s, 
um, it's really not going to do much for glycemic control. So I probably would not pick that one. Um, in terms of adding a potassium binder, that's, uh, that can be done. I would, however, try the other strategies first because potassium binders, especially the uh, SPS, are not well tolerated long term, perhaps. So I would try the other strategies first. In terms of dietary counseling, that's always a good strategy uh, when someone does have hyperkalemia. Um, so general counseling on potassium, but it's really focusing on the um, limiting the processed foods and, and the bioavailability concept and um, eating more foods with fiber uh, will help as well with the constipation because he's uh, the patient's taking iron supplements. So the dietitian can also address fluid intake um, as well as the fiber and physical activity. So this question has multiple potential answers. And okay, let's continue with case two. Um, we'll get to questions and such at the end. But um, so let's continue on the case. The diuretic is initiated, but he didn't tolerate it due to hyper or hyponatremia. And uh, to optimize glycemic control, the patient was started on semaglutide. Uh, and for constipation management, the patient had dietary counseling to increase fiber and uh, as needed laxative started. After these interventions, the serum potassium remains consistently elevated above 5.5. So uh, I'm just going to activate this last question here. All right. What is your next step in managing hyperkalemia? Would you reduce the RAS inhibitor dose? more dietary counseling, start a potassium binder, or A and C. And you can go through the poll everywhere. Okay, so it looks like most of you are saying start potassium binder at this point. On the chat box, there's a few other choices. People say reduce the RAS inhibitor dose and start the potassium binder. So I think in this case, the next step would be to start the potassium binder if you've tried the, the diuretic and the addressing the underlying causes of the hyperglycemia and the constipation. Uh, so this would be a good time to start a potassium binder. Only as a last resort would, you, would we want to go to uh, reducing the telmisartan. Um, I understand it might be done temporarily, but it is important to try to um, keep up the, the RAS inhibitor um, at the maximum tolerated dose as much as we can. So, so I agree with um, starting the potassium binder at this point. So just wrapping up here, um, hyperkalemia is multifactorial. Uh, consider other patient and clinical factors before you consider diet, given the association between dietary potassium and serum potassium is very weak. Um, and you would go to discontinuation of RAS inhibitor as a last resort if uh, all the other strategies did not uh, work and there is uncontrolled hyperkalemia. When considering diet, uh, do um, counsel patients on bioavailability of potassium source and therefore uh, limiting processed foods and encouraging balanced diets are recommended. Um, and it's important that all multidisciplinary team members uh, deliver a consistent message to patients regarding potassium management um, to avoid giving conflicting advice to patients. And the educational resources are listed at the bottom. So the healthcare provider one is from the RAS inhibitor toolkit, and the patient handout is the um, one from BC Renal. So um, BC Renal also has a lot of resources on diet. Uh, and I can put in the link in the chat box there. But I'm happy to take any questions. And uh, thank you very much for your participation. Questions? Uh, thank you, Prof Wong, uh, for that enlightening presentation. I must say that uh, I've learned a couple of things from your talk. Um, uh, one is that I had no idea that potassium had a circadian rhythm. Uh, that is probably something pretty new for me. So it is something to be taken uh, note of when I'm going to check my patient's potassium uh, from now on. Um, and secondly, uh, glucosamine. 
the supplement. Uh, this is something that is so readily, uh, you know, dished out over the counter or, you know, patients come in with arthritis and arthritic pains and it is something that's like more of a default that is usually given. So it is something that, again, I had no idea about that may actually potentially be amount of potassium. So it is something to kind of uh, just be wary about. And uh, I think I need to personally, you know, look at the labels behind it, just make sure that whatever I'm giving does not have uh, potassium in that because I may want to do good, but I may actually be doing harm, especially in, in, in the CKD patients. Um, maybe if I can just uh, uh, give one or two comments and then uh, you can you can perhaps, uh, you know, give your opinion on it. So uh, the, the question uh, regarding the hyperkalemia um, and uh, SGLD2 inhibitors. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it may, it will most likely lead to, um, to hypokalemia. But my thought was that because SGLT2 uh, uh, inhibitors cause glycosuria, and if the patient is not adequately hydrated, uh, they may become fluid behind, and there is a slight risk of AKI, which then would lead to hyperkalemia. So, I mean, it's it's either way, you can kind of argue, uh, you know, the patient may not be adequately hydrated, and that may lead to hyperkalemia. But most most likely, uh, it will cause hypokalemia, I mean, or caluresis if the patient is adequately hydrated or if there is adequate fluid intake. And then um, the second comment was, um, especially with the SPS uh, potassium binders and constipation, uh, from what I was taught when I was a fellow, is that if you have constipation, rather give uh, a laxative than a potassium binder, so something like sorbitol or, uh, or lactulose to try and evacuate the, the bowel rather than giving something like uh, SPS or you know another potassium binder because these tend to cause constipation or rather you know they bind uh, the, 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 the the ions in the in the colon uh, the colon exchanges so this may actually lead to worsening or even you know increasing the risk of bowel perforation and ischemia so for me when I see constipation I look at uh, a laxative rather than SPS. Uh, so this is something maybe to consider, especially with the iron supplement that the patient was receiving, uh, that we should be, uh, you know, uh, conversant, that we shouldn't be you know, giving things that may cause more harm uh, than good. And perhaps uh, just one more comment uh, is that uh, we shouldn't be mixing um, potassium binders and laxatives together because that has got an increased risk of uh, developing uh, bowel ischemia and, um, and perforation. So you give either one or the other. So yeah. that is my 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 points. Yeah, all, all good uh, comments. Um, so for the SGLT2 inhibitor, um, I think that, uh, yeah, they are associated with reduced risk of severe hyperkalemia, um, which could be helpful in, in managing hyperkalemia. Uh, they, are not actually associated with increased risk of AKI, um, uh, but they they do cause a little dip in kidney function. Um, with the um, the sort of uh, the glycosuric effect, um, you do have to be careful about hydration. I, I totally agree with that, though. Uh, so it is important when you're counseling patients. Um, to make sure they're adequately hydrated. If they're on existing diuretics, they may need less um, of that diuretic dose. Um, so it's good to reevaluate their volume status. I'd say overall, it, it could be a helpful uh, strategy for uh, for potassium management. But it, again, it is a multifactorial issue. So I think a multi-pronged approach often helps. Uh, for the constipation, yeah, I totally agree with starting with laxatives and dietary counseling and fiber intake first, um, and then um, seeing if the potassium can improve um, with that, and then um, uh, following that, like consideration of uh, of a potassium binder. I do agree that you shouldn't take them together at the same time. Um, because uh, that will increase the risk of um, of those severe gastrointestinal side effects and perforation and, and things like that. So I agree you should not use them together. Um, often a lot of patients with constipation may use the laxatives 
more sparingly um, and just kind of as needed. But yes, certainly monitoring for gastrointestinal side effects um, when taking a potassium binder is, uh, is important. Um, we note that often potassium binder prescriptions are, are short duration. Patients often don't tolerate um, taking these binders long term, like the traditional binders. I think the newer binders are supposed to be much more uh, or better tolerated. Uh, so it remains to be seen in real world studies if um, if we can maintain patients on uh, chronic uh, potassium binders with the new binders, do they tolerate it better? Are there less side effects? Um, yeah, are those new binders actually available in in your region? No, we just have the SPS, so the sodium and the calcium uh, for the starting plus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because it is yeah. still I think prohibitively expensive uh, yeah. it, to procure and to register also. So so we haven't yet uh, gotten them. Yeah, they're they're not even funded in our uh, province at this time through our renal yeah. program, but they're certainly looking into um, assessing uh, patient reported tolerability to see if uh, if it's worthwhile to fund them. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they're so as a result, they're they're not widely used right now in our setting. Okay, um, Dr. Lloyd is asking a question. Dr. Lloyd, do you want to unmute? Uh... Or do you want me to read out the question? Yeah. Now about this uh, plant base, it's really nice that you pointed out on the bioavailability of uh, potassium as compared to the animal protein. Uh, so, um, and, and and quite often in diabetes, we really don't know if there is a type five RTA uh, hyperanemic hyperaldosteronism, and so that kind uh, and that sort of thing. Do you think a plant based protein will help in this situation? Because as you pointed out, bioavailability is less when you actually use that? Uh, or do you think uh, more uh, stringent measures would be needed in that, this sort of a situation? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's why I think it's really important to try to individualize um, the management. Um, so um, obviously you want to promote a diet that is um, sustainable for the patient um, and that tries to you know, incorporate strategies that they can maintain long term. So, um, I, I think the general counseling on potassium is uh, is fine. They uh, and I think it just remains to be seen. Like certainly, the renal tuber acidosis is going to increase the risk of hyperkalemia, um, and uh, they the dietitian would need to look at their intake to kind of make some tweaks. You know, there may be certain things that they could be consuming a huge uh, potassium content through certain foods like potatoes or whatever sweet potatoes. And we, they, you may have to cut them down and do the leaching of the, with the double boiling and such. But um, I think it really depends. Bioavailability is important, but it is possible potentially if the content is high enough that that does become a important factor. Um, so I think it's important to reduce the really high potassium uh, or the concentrated forms of potassium that could be in coffee or juices or dried fruits and things like that. So I think it really re requires a dietitian to dissect everything that they're eating and uh, making some recommendations um, in the context of all of their risk factors for hyperkalemia. I have a question um, in the Q&A box. Uh, for patients with uncontrolled hyperkalemia on bi-weekly hemodialysis and not making urine, well adherent on diet with only limited foods due to financial status, not on any potential medication or herbs that would cause hyperkalemia, can they be on a potassium binder throughout? Yeah, so I guess potentially. Um, so if you exhausted all sort of other reversible causes um, and yeah, if they have no appreciable urine output and, and a diuretic is not going to be helpful, um, yeah, then a potassium binder can be used. Um, and so I think during planning for disasters and things like that, we often 
I want to be able to use potassium binders in cases if people are missing dialysis sessions potentially, um, that they can be um, used as a kind of a temporizing measure to um, maintain the potassium within a safe range. Um, so yeah, potentially potassium binders can be used in um, in hemodialysis patients if there's a chronic issue with um, with the hyperkalemia um, and also just you know adjusting you know, the potassium baths and things like that. So I think you have a bit more fine control if they're on hemodialysis. So you you may want to try other things before putting them on a long term potassium binder. No, so uh, maybe I just wanted to add on that, that uh, these potassium binders usually are not recommended for long-term use because of the risk of, uh, of GI side effects. So you can probably use them for maybe 10 days, 14 days, perhaps, you know, I mean, maybe if you want to really push it, maybe a month, but probably not longer than that, because the longer you use them, the higher the risk of, of developing these GI side effects, uh, which can actually be devastating. So uh, you, you, as you said, you need to find other ways uh, to try and mitigate this uh, this issue of, of the hyperkalemia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there may be some some dietary recommendations that can be made, like within the context of their socioeconomic situation. Um, there, there's still some uh, uh, sort of dietary um, strategies that can be employed. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But thanks, th thanks for the good lecture. You know, issues of uh, potassium management are a problem even for us here in Kenya especially amongst the patients on dialysis. Now, one thing I didn't hear you comment on was uh, actually the role or the contribution of dialysis towards the management of potassium. I don't know, would it be a consideration or was this a talk largely geared to people who have still not qualified for dialysis? Uh, yeah, sorry. So your question was like how to manage the potassium with, with dialysis prescription? Yeah, yeah. So it was, it, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, yeah. go ahead, Dr. Biko. Yeah, yeah. Actually, we, we know that dialysis uh, has a, 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 actually a clear role in terms of uh, electrolyte management in patients with the uh, encephalinol yeah. yeah. Right. So, yeah, that, that's the comment that maybe uh, I, I saw as absent in the presentation. So I, I don't know whether you are limiting yourself to non-dialysis patients. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think the, but you're right. I didn't, I didn't cover the sort of dialysis prescription for potassium management. Um, the, uh, the focus was really more on the dietary aspects with consideration of some of the other like medications we can use and things like that. Uh, so you're right. I did leave out that, that topic of, uh, the dialysis prescription, but certainly, um, Yes, that is an important strategy for uh, for patients on um, on dialysis. So generally, you know, you can adjust the potassium bath according to their um, pre uh, HD uh, potassium levels. Um, in PD, uh, hyperkalemia is probably less of an issue. Usually, uh, patients can be I'm a hypokalemic. Yeah, I didn't have quite much to add on to that and, and really wanted to focus on sort of the um, sort of modifiable factors with, and diet. Um, yeah, just, but it, it is interesting though that a lot of the studies of diet um, in, uh, have been done in the hemodialysis population and that you can vary your potassium intake by like fourfold but the serum potassium may only change by about 0.4. So it's, there really is a weak association there, even in hemodialysis patients. Yeah, but, but certainly um, uh, patients on dialysis, uh, you can have uh, much, I guess, finer control over the potassium because you're measuring it uh, much more often and, and can adjust using um, the dialysis bath. Um, thank you, Prof. Um, we've got uh, another question uh, from one of our renal nutritionists um, in Tanzania. 
So his question is for the NU reparations, how does diuretics use to manage hyperkalemia? And then his follow-up question is according to the discussion, dietary restrictions are a myth. Uh, consider patients who are on maintenance hemodialysis and perform dialysis twice per month. Uh, so the dietary restrictions is not applicable to these patients. So if patients are aneuric, um, diuretics are not going to be helpful for managing hyperkalemia. So you do have to use other strategies. So if, if you have patients on maintenance hemodialysis that are getting dialysis very infrequently it says twice per month yeah it says so dietary restrictions is not applicable so i'm not quite certain about that question is i think obviously uh there is definitely a risk of uh hyperkalemia if someone is only in dialysis that infrequently uh but the general strategies for dietary recommendations still exist um I think we, we want to make sure that um, patients um, appreciate the, the most, uh, they have to limit the most bioavailable sources of potassium. So that's going to be in processed yes. food, going to be in a lot yes. of like animal proteins um, and that um, they still want to maintain adequate nutrition. Um, and that can still be achieved with uh, a more plant-based diet. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I think to, to some extent, I think the, the traditional approach is to, you know, give patients those lists of high and low potassium foods and say, okay, yeah. it has high potassium content, you should restrict those things. And then that leads to uh, very restrictive diets for patients that's very difficult to maintain. And. And it really might not be that helpful because the potassium content is not reflective of the bioavailability. And so um, I think that if we try to educate patients more generally on strategies that uh, limit those processed foods, encourage more whole foods, um, <clears throat> that is the approach we want to take. Um, and that can be incorporated more easily potentially into their sort of traditional food ways and their sort of their culture. But um, I think we need more real world implementation studies now to see, um, you know, is it acceptable to patients? Do they have less hyperkalemia in, in real practice? Um, so that is something that I'm, um, planning to do uh, because we did change all of our educational materials for both patients and we have this new provider facing handout now so we want to see you know is it actually effective in um, being implemented into practice but secondly you know um, what is the effectiveness of it in um, reducing risk of hyperkalemia and having uh, better sort of patient um, acceptability. Thank you, uh, Bob. Um, maybe one last uh, question. Um, does oral calcium supplementation have a protective effect in patients who usually have hyperkalemia? So I think this is pertaining to the complications and the risk of uh, cardiac uh, arrhythmias and cardiac protection. If patients are on oral calcium supplementation, do they have a protective effect on uh, with hyperkalemia on patients that we Yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm actually not um, not sure about like chronic um, calcium supplementation if that actually has some cardioprotective effect um, for sort of acute management, um, giving the IV calcium. Uh, yeah, is protective against arrhythmias, but. Um, Chronically, um, I, I am not certain about that, actually. Um, uh, usually, the sort of arrhythmic effects are going to be if the, um, if the potassium rises very suddenly and acutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, yeah. I think that's where the, the calcium is going to be protective. And so um, 
chronically, if it's just uh, elevated uh, potassium, it's probably not going to have that arrhythmogenic potential that, um, and therefore calcium uh, benefit of calcium supplementation is um, uncertain at that, in that point. I'll, I'll probably um, add on that that uh, the calcium that we give, the calcium gluconate, uh, is all usually very short acting as well. I mean, it doesn't last for too long. So, given that it's a you know high concentration calcium that we give IV that doesn't last too long, I mean, what are the chances that if you take oral calcium supplementation, which bioavailability may again be a problem, uh, that would kind of keep that protection of protective layer on? So, uh, I mean, I. I echo your sentiment or your, or your opinion, and I feel that it's just probably adaptability of the body in itself to kind of tolerate that high level of potassium because of the CKD, rather than, uh, you know, all the supplementation of calcium uh, in, as a protective uh, method for, for the hypokalemia. Yeah? Mm, agreed, yeah. I think that was the last question uh, for uh, Professor Wong. Um, it was great to have you. And I, you, as you can see, uh, there was quite a lot of uh, questions uh, and uh, there was a lot of participation from the from the participant side. Clearly, uh, there are certain things that we still don't know about nutrition, and I think uh, we are guilty of this because we don't focus much more uh, on this. And presentations like this are actually practice changing. Uh, at least, at least for me, I'm going to at least do these two things that I mentioned uh, when we started the questioning. Uh, so again, I would like to thank you very much for taking our time uh, and uh, giving us this enlightening talk. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure if Dr. Lloyd, if you would like to say something before we will close. So thank you very much, Michelle. I think a wonderful session. You know, there's so much of uh, new things that you brought about. Uh, practice changing, like uh, not to focus you know, too much, too much on you know hyperkalemia and such. I mean, the foods, uh, you know, high and low. The bioavailability, I think, is extremely important. Plant-based protein, very important. And the other measures also to take. You know, it's very, very interesting. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for taking your time and, and coming on here. And I think this will go on YouTube. Uh, and I think this will definitely make, uh, as uh, Dr. Mazza mentioned, a lot of practice change uh, in the region. So an extremely useful session. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, thank you for having me. I've left a link for the BC Renal Diet Handouts. They're a good resource yeah. for many other yeah. Uh, yeah. aspects of diet as well. Yeah. If okay. you can give me the links, I, I'll send it across across the board here. The whole okay. region. Yeah, sure. that'll be great. Fantastic. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Michelle. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you so much, Prof. Bye. Thank you. Bye.